May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. So it is Trinity Sunday, and you have, uh, your parish priest now is one of those weirdos who actually likes preaching on the Trinity. I like it. Uh, it's, um, it's a wonderful, uh, it's a symbol, it's a theological image. It, it is not um, merely an idea that the church came up with because they thought it was cool. I say this because if this was an idea, like some kind of clever strategy for mission, this is a terrible idea, right? It's so complicated and strange, and nobody gets it. And it's not this concise little marketing package, right, that you can give to people. I mean, no one really seems to adequately describe it. We offer things like shamrocks and stuff, and it doesn't really work. It's not a good idea to come up with the Trinity. It also creates a lot of tension with our, our Muslim and Jewish brothers and sisters, because they're like, are you guys crazy? Are you polytheists? Are you not? Right? So it's... it's it's not a good idea, but it's what God did. The, we, the reason why we have the Trinity is because we have experienced God in our own lives and as a church in, it seems to be, three very um, special and distinct ways um, such that we, we felt it necessary to describe God as having three persons because each one of these ways seems to be Personal. It seems to be special and different. And so I want to talk about the three persons of the Trinity, God the Son, God the Father, and God the Holy Spirit, not as uh, ideas, but as experiences that we have of God. Uh, and that's why the Trinity is so important for us. I'm going to start with God the Son, because it seems that for each of us as Christians, not all of us, absolutely not all of us, but for many of us as Christians, it seems to be through God the Son that we first encounter the church. Um, we can describe our relationship with God the Son kind of as a horizontal one. Um, we know about God the Son um, through how Jesus described who he was. And he says, if you want to meet me, if you want to encounter me, I'm the, my resurrected self, whatever you do to the least of these you do to me, right? Jesus was very emphatic and he was really not negotiable in a lot of stuff. When you love one another, you love me. When you visit the hungry, the sick, you feed me and you visit me. Jesus was emphatic that if you want to encounter me in this world, you must seek me out by loving one another and in particular, loving people who are vulnerable in our society, people who are on the margins, people who are suffering. If you want to find me, I will be there. Christ is found in love. And this is perhaps our most, of all of the ways to encounter God, this is the most, um, the most immediate, right? The, the, whenever people come through our doors, usually, and they're talking, oh, I was so excited when I joined Epiphany. They never say, because of the profundity of the sacraments. Usually, it's not. <laughs> the conversation is usually, I came to Epiphany, and people were so warm and generous, and I felt welcome. I felt God working through this place. Right? It's God, and so uh, God the Son is usually... Uh, this is usually how we encounter God. And like each of the persons of the Trinity, uh, the depth of each of these experiences is not simply lovely or wonderful. It is holy and profound. And Jesus was quite emphatic that if you want to know the very depths of God, the very essence of who God is, all the most profound things that a philosopher might teach or a mystic might pray, you can find that profundity of God in love, in love for one another. It's, uh, it's not simply a gateway into knowing God. 
God is love. And the scriptures are utterly clear on this. Right? So, we have God the Son, uh, who is God. And everything that God is can be encountered through God the Son. But, there's more. There's actually three. There's also God the Father. Um, We also sometimes call God the Father, God the Creator. The church has often, especially in the 20th and 21st century, tried to come up with... um, My microphone is off. Um, we've often tried to come up with, as a, as a church, um, a gender-neutral trinity, right? Instead of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, is there a way we can kind of make that gender-neutral, right? So we've come up with uh, Creator, Redeemer, Sanctifier. The reason why we've had problems with that is one of the best things about the trinity is that they're persons, and the trinity is in love with itself. God is in love with the Son, The Son is in love with the Father. The Holy Spirit is love itself. That's how St. Augustine described the Trinity. Beloved, lover, and love. Uh, And when we have creator, redeemer, sanctifier, it's not nearly as... There's not a relationship there, right? The creator loving the redeemer. It doesn't quite fit. So we haven't haven't really come up with anything better than Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but there's some... So I just got to... Why not include that in there? So God the Father, God the Creator, if Jesus is a horizontal relationship, uh, a God, a holiness that we encounter through one another, then we might describe God the Father as more of a vertical relationship. Uh, Just as emphatically throughout the Bible, we encounter a God who is beyond our comprehension, a God who we search for, a God who cannot be captured and yet we try, nonetheless, to capture the essence of who God is in art, philosophy, music, mathematics, theology, ethics, liturgy, symbols, poetry. A God that cannot be named. A God we encounter in wonder, in moments of transcendence. That which we try to understand, but that which is Uh, incomprehensible, right? And so we turn to the arts and the sciences and philosophy to have some sense of uh, of the world, of who God is. And it's really frustrating in this time in history, and this is a relatively rare time in history, where the sciences, the arts, and religion and theology see themselves as operating in their own unique bubbles, which is not the case, right? In in each field, I mean, a wonderful conversation uh, and and a reflection group earlier this week, in each field, These are people standing at the abyss of what we don't know. If you are a scientist, you are not sitting there congratulating one another with all the things that uh, you know, right? You're not sitting, let's run that experiment again. It's last time we succeeded, and we'll do the same thing again, and we'll prove once again that we are right. That's not what science is about, right? Science is about approaching the very limits of our understanding and wrestling with how much we don't know. The limits of our understanding of the human mind, of the cosmos, of the essence of reality. Right? It's, 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 uh, and then you also wrestle with the fact that a lot of great scientists towards the end of their careers have some young scientists disproving their life's work. <laughs> because there's, everything is founded upon theories and uh, there's, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of unknowable unknowns that go on in the world. So in the world of science, and of course artists is the same thing, a, a songwriter can't simply sing the same songs that they wrote back in the 1980s and 90s over and over and over again for the rest of their lives. There's a constant thirst to write a new song, to paint a new painting, to create a new sculpture. Everything about God the Father, God the Creator, is about something new, something different, which is to say something that we do not know, that we have not seen. The church is no different. We're constantly at the precipice of unknowing as God continues to create beyond that which we can understand. And we're struggling to catch up as a church, just like every other great tradition and institution. So God the Father kind of captures all of this. It's again, that you, you, know, you can seek out God the Father and spend the rest of your life trying to find God in art, in creation, in all that is created. We ourselves are creatures who have been created And in a lot of ways, our greatest callings are when we create. When we create children, 
when we create great works of art, when we build things, when we create new discoveries, creating medicine. We are creatures who love to create, and we are made in the image of a God who loves creation and who loves to create. And just like God the Son, the God the Father is this is this is the scriptures are absolutely filled with all of this stuff. And we can just as we can spend our whole lives loving other people and seeking other people out, we can spend our whole lives plumbing the depths of all the great traditions and trying to find a God that we can't know or understand. It's fantastic, right? Just as important as God the Son, just as powerful, just as much a part of our Christian tradition. But there's three. There's God the Holy Spirit. And if God the Father is sort of a vertical understanding of constantly wrestling with something we don't understand, and if God the Son is horizontal, God the Holy Spirit is here. Uh, If we think of the great philosophers and artists uh, seeking out God the Father, if if we think of like the Mother Teresa and all the great seeking out the poor and the sick, seeking out Jesus... We can think of the mystics when we think of the Holy Spirit. Those who seek out God in prayer. Uh, the earliest monks were not educated in the slightest. The earliest monks didn't have any books. Uh, they might have not even had a lot of books of the Bible. They went out to pray. They also weren't surrounded by people, the earliest monks. They were often on their own. And without really any Uh, intellectual or artistic development, and without any contact with the outside world, they, in a lot of powerful ways, became holy. They became holy because they prayed. And they prayed profoundly, they prayed without ceasing, and with a fierce belief that prayer itself can transform us. That praying to God can be as powerful, as transformative, as enlightening, as the greatest works of art, and as some of the greatest things we can do for one another. And so, of course, what happened was, these people became holy, and we sought them out. And so they became surrounded by people, and uh, a lot of great scholars were attracted to be among them, because they could tell there was something that was going on. There's a great story from from St. Augustine, where he was furious because he'd spent his last 20 years studying Greek and Latin and he encountered these monks and he said these guys don't even know how to read and they're closer to God than I've ever been and in our own lives I'm sure this place is filled um, with memories and possibly some people but I think we all know these people where there's not a lot of book learning so to speak Um, These might be great introverts that we know, but I've met some people where you can tell that they pray all the time. And people who pray all the time are changed and different and special. I don't know if all of you know some of these people. We're often blessed to... We never... uh, These people are rare. They don't stand out. They don't give great speeches but we somehow can never miss them. We can always spot them in a crowd. Do you know who I'm talking about? These kinds of people? Um, these are often, uh, I don't know, I, I, I don't know how to, there's, for me, a lot of times I, I've encountered some, some clergy, I, I, I find I'm always preoccupied, I, I spend way too much thinking, I just think a lot, it's not, I don't know how productive it is, but Anyways, and I, I'll encounter some other clergy where, um, as much as I'm thinking, they're praying, and they're transformed. And it's humbling because no matter how much I think, they seem to know more than me. Uh, it's very humbling to encounter someone who has been spending their life seeking out the Holy Spirit in their hearts. And there is deep wisdom there as much wisdom as can be found seeking out God any other way. Which is why um, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit seeking out each of these experiences can lead us to the same place, which is an encounter with God and an encounter with the Holy. And the reality is, of course, they're all intertwined. 
they're all interconnected. And we usually, when we find one, we very swiftly find the other. I went off to some ivory tower, seeking out God the Father, so to speak, and I end up in parish ministry and desperately seeking prayer. Right? Some of us go another way. Some of us became, become very powerful praying introverts, not wanting to have anything to do with the church. And then somehow you end up here. Right? We have some of those prisoners. I don't know why I'm here exactly. I'd rather just be alone and pray with God. But, but here I am. And I'll just like, I guess that sermon was kind of interesting. Right? <laughs> and then we have people who want to love. We have people in this place who want to love, and that's about it. I just want to love people. You don't actually have to tell me anything. I don't really have to read this Bible. I just want to love. And they're drawn in by the tradition and the music and the art. And they're fed by prayer as they pray alone. Because sometimes when we love and love and love, we can be fed by that. But there's a very different kind of food that can come from prayer. So the Trinity is wonderful. The Trinity is a guide. It shows us three ways of encountering God. It can protect the church if we as Christians or as a church get too fixated on one way of encountering God. Sometimes we need to be reminded that there are other ways. We have some very, there's some very, uh, churches very focused on this up-down stuff that maybe need to reach out to their community. We have other churches that are really reaching out um, and don't pray enough, right? We can, we can think of churches that, are, that, that struggle to balance this and each of our lives. I'm sure there's a certain imbalance for each of us. But Seeking any of these ways will inevitably lead to all three, so it's, it's all quite intertwined. And so I couldn't, uh, I love preaching on the Trinity. I hope that wasn't, I'm sure that was way too long, because that was probably three sermons, but, uh, you know, that's very Trinitarian, I suppose. Um, so let us celebrate the Trinity, God the, Fun, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit this Sunday morning, through Christ's name. Amen.